All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome into another episode of D&D Dynamite 80s. I'm D8. I'm DC. And we're here to bring uh, take a good look back and bring you some of the fun stuff that made the 80s such an awesome era. <clears throat> See, I've, I've been looking forward to this ever since you told me about this one. This is going to be an amazing uh, interview here. So I'm going to just, without Awesome. Waiting, yes. Over to you. Yes, we, we're uh, privileged to have Jack Hughes with us today. And he is with Wayne Chung, of course. Jack, how are you? I'm pretty good, thanks. Yeah, Good, Happy good. Guys. Gentlemen, I have to start out with this first because it's ironic that it just happened today. It was meant to be. I pulled my vehicle out of the, out of the garage for my, you know, run some errands today. And Mark Goodman is playing some 80s stuff on his serious uh, show. And uh, the song, exactly, as I'm pulling out, is everybody have fun tonight? <laughs> I heard the whole entire song at the very start, so it was meant to be. That yeah, so yeah, that was a, a sign that we were going to be together today. Yeah, but that, I just thought that was yeah, awesome. Yeah. So that was pretty cool. That is, um, Jack. Let me start with this first because uh, because yeah. I'm curious. I always like to ask uh, artists this: um, when you're you have performed for so many years with the same uh, repetition of songs. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I seen a recent interview with a, with a gentleman that was with a very successful band, uh, for about 26, 27 years. And he just got to the point where it was kind of like, he, he talked like it was factory work, mm-hmm. um, where same set, same song, same set, yeah. same song yeah. night after night after night. And he just, he had that, he had that where I've got to go out and do my own creative thing. Mm. Does that does that sometimes kind of sneak in there on you as well? I think I mix things up enough to not really uh, experience that, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you know, there's the Wang Chung tours. I mean, after the band split in say around about 1990, really late 89, you know, and then for 20 years, really Nick and I really didn't do anything together as Wang Chung. Mm-hmm. And then we started doing these uh, tours in the summer in the states and a little bit of work in the UK and Europe as well. Uh, and I did it for a couple of years and then I stepped back and then I did it for another couple of years and and I haven't really done that stuff uh, for about three or four years now, you know. So the prospect of coming to the States in August to, uh, yeah. to do more shows is very exciting, you know. And we'll sort of do a little bit of rehearsal and revamp the set a little bit. Uh, and I think my other projects are much more kind of, um, what should we say, like around improvisation and, and around sort of jazz and prog rock i suppose you could say so it's a very different sort of uh space that i'm in when i'm doing those shows um uh so yeah like i say i think i mix it up enough to make to keep it interesting for myself gotcha gotcha one of the things i I would like to to just kind of hear some about was some of the aspects of i mean you guys were touring cutting records i mean you had like zero time probably still do but uh my thing is what are some of the aspects that you really enjoyed about that particular uh format of life that you were living well when we were touring and so on do you mean yeah well i mean the shows were amazing uh in the sense of playing to these massive audiences you know so in 1984 when dance all days was a hit we were on tour with the cars and uh, that was on their um, Heartbeat City album, I think. And uh, uh, Drive was the big song on that record, you know. And uh, so they were packing out these kind of 60 to 80,000 seaters every night. And we were the opening act. But unlike a lot of gigs you go to where the opening act is plays to a half empty place, we were playing to pretty packed hall. Yeah. You know, uh, people wanted to come and see us. Um, so that, that aspect of it was, I guess, slightly daunting in a sense, uh, hard, hard to take in, you know, uh, but exciting and being pitched from playing little clubs in London with sort of two or 300 people to playing, you know, Meadowlands outside of New York City and stuff was pretty intense, you know. Um, but I think, uh, I I also had, a I used to enjoy being, you know, American cities are, are great to just, you know, you land on the tour bus or the, whatever it is you're traveling in, you know, check into the hotel and then go out onto the street and more or less most cities have a great vibe on the street of one sort or another and they also have great art galleries which I'm interested in great bookshops which I love and this is I guess in the days you know in the 80s there was no internet and audio books and and stuff on your kindle and there was nothing like that so 
my suitcase gradually filled up with books and CDs and stuff, you know. Um, so yeah, that that aspect of um, what should we say, self development. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it gave me plenty of time to do that, you know. And that's not to say that there weren't the old party and the old kind of after show <laughs> thing. It was also fun, you know. I did my job as a rock and roll star, <laughs> but, uh, but but I was interested in other stuff as well. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. It's funny yeah. that you mentioned that the way we didn't have all the internet and stuff back in the eighties. Yeah. Well, which are always like, what did y'all do? And I'm like, we didn't live in the dark ages. I'm telling you, <laughs> it's true. Yeah. That's true. It was a it was a great time to to yeah. grow up. That's for sure. Yeah, well, um, you it, go out and do things. Do you know yeah, I mean? just, that's exactly right. Go home and do things, you know, and so that makes a big difference. I think. Absolutely. Yeah, and that's kind of uh, that leads me into the next thing I want to kind of talk to you about um, music videos. Of course, they mm. became real popular. Uh, yeah. In that in the eighty decade, of course, and dance hall days, of course, sticks out to me very much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dale, what is that? Is it V V O that we have? V O, I think, on uh, the Pluto TV. Yeah. Anyway, where they play eighties videos twenty four seven now, and of course they play that one quite often. I see it. Matter of fact, I seen it this week as okay. I was doing some stuff. So. Uh, of course, that one sticks out to me uh, right. as well. But the the one I wanted to talk to you about, which is pretty cool, the live and let die in L.A. OK. Yeah. 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 What you know, that, that has to be pretty cool to be like chosen your music to be in a, in, in a movie, that kind of thing. And it yeah. sticks out because, of course, you guys are implemented in it. Yeah. But you see, you know, scenes from the movie that stick yeah. out to you. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. That keeps keeps you in the loop. All these oh, years as well. well. Yeah. Well, the thing is with that uh, that video, Bill Freakin, you know, who, you know, Billy directed The Exorcist and The French Connection mm -hmm. as well as To Live and Die in L.A. Uh, so he's an incredibly experienced movie director, you know, and he wanted to direct that video for us. Wow. And, uh, you know, he didn't do it for charity. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but like, you know, not many bands get the opportunity to work with someone like Billy. So uh, that was an incredible privilege. And, and of course, yeah. he made the film. He owned the rights to the film. He wasn't working for a studio, you know. So the great thing about working was, with him was, well, there were many great things, but one of the things was you had direct access to the movie and executive decisions about what could be done and what couldn't be done, you know. And so, you know, uh, obviously he used the video to a certain extent as a promotional tool for the movie. But yeah. uh, that, that was amazing, you know, to work with him and, uh, and his general sense of doing things and you know great cinematographers and stuff yeah yeah and interestingly what? you know we work with billy on to live and die in la we also work with a, a famous english director called Derek Derek jarman on uh, uh dance all days so there are two dance all days yeah here, you know? oh is, okay um the one with the mirror ball and the, and the twins and all of that stuff you know right which we made for america but the first video we made was a much more english oriented thing where we're dressed up with characters from the wizard of oz and stuff you know? <laughs> and this was derek jarman's vision you know and, and yeah. derek was uh you know a, like a very avant-garde filmmaker in the uk you know and uh yeah he was doing pop videos to finance his kind of pretty out there films of the time you know but nevertheless that, that was a great privilege working with him you know and uh, I remember you know going to his place he lived on Charing Cross Road in the UK in, in London you know and um, you know he was very much part of a sort of arts theatre scene you know that was that was really interesting at that time. Yeah yeah um, talk to us a little bit about the upcoming like you said a little bit ago the upcoming tour I know that there is a amazing lineup that you guys are going to be a part of in Las Vegas coming up yeah um yeah i mean just unbelievable talent in that in that show yeah yeah i mean it is uh yeah it's a sort of traveling show that's for sure you know um so we work a lot with um flock of seagulls and, uh -huh. um, the english beat are on a lot of those shows as well um yeah and it's a great bunch of guys really you know um we've done enough touring on this lost 80s thing together to be friends and uh you know there's a lot of mutual support uh, if you need support uh, but it's not just you know it's not like support in an emergency kind of way it's just right, like, you right. know, get on together and make sure that it's a great show for the, the people who come along and pay yeah. yeah yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely yeah I think one of the cool things is and and I kind of like to get your aspect on this is music from the 80s like Wang Chung's music it just 
it it doesn't get old it doesn't fade Mm -hmm. it's like even like because we teach high school my kids are like oh man can you play this or can you play that and it's amazing to see them do that why do you think that is I, i i mean i know you guys are very talented musicians and i think that's something that i will I don't want to say anything bad about today's music, but you don't see as much musicianship in mm. the works. That, that's my feeling too. Yeah, that absolutely. An aspect mm. of it, or... too commercialized for me, or something. Well, I don't know. It's not feeling ghettoized in in the sense that you know commercial music yeah. is very much in its space. Yeah, uh, and it has a certain look about it. I mean, there was plenty of commercial music in the eighties. You know that um, yeah. didn't sort of uh, doesn't stand the test of time so well you know but i think there were i think in the 80s there was a lot of money sloshing around the business uh, that encouraged mm. sort of talented musicians uh and and i think the video thing was in its infancy you know i mean we went to the first mtv awards i remember you know and mtv was like the cutting edge thing and rather like tiktok is now i guess you know <laughs> so it felt modern it felt cutting edge you know making videos for me was a very kind of strange thing to be doing you know because mm-hmm. i'm not terrible or I don't mind it so much now, but back then I wasn't comfortable in front of the camera as, as shows <laughs> in a lot of the videos, I think, you know. But um, yeah, as for the music, I think, you know, there were talented musicians, but there were also really talented producers as well, you know. So we worked with uh, Chris Hughes on and Ross Cullum on Dance All Days, but they just come off the back of working with Tears for Fears on The Hurting and went on to make uh, songs from The Big Chair. Uh, mm. And then we worked with Peter Wolf, you know, and Peter had just produced Starship and um, we built the city when he worked with us on uh, Everybody Are Fun Tonight, you know. And the studios were incredible at that time as well. You know, they were really beautifully maintained and had incredible gear in them, you know. When people talk to me about like, oh, you know, back in the 80s, I guess the recording was, it was you know, it was quite primitive compared to what we have now. It's like, no way, it was so much better than it is now, you know. Because we were working with great, you know, tape machines, um, you know, sort of the 24 track tape machines with Dolby and uh, Dolby S noise reduction. I guess maybe they've got it even better these days. But, you know, you had a basically silent noise floor to contend with, you know, but you had all the advantages of the richness of tape compression and stuff. You know? So, um, and like I say, the studios had great engineers and, and there, there was a whole sort of professional scene, you know, whereas now I, I think it, you don't have quite that professional guidance. But then having said that, I think there are some great musicians around and some some great bands you know there's a uh, an album that came out in 2020 uh, called promises by a guy called um who goes under the name of floating points and uh, i guess you could mm. argue it's like the ambient kind of record but uh but but it's magnificent you know it's really fantastic and uh and i'm a big fan of the new um uh this band called the smile which is tom york and johnny greenwood from radiohead they've just put this album out mm. Tom Skinner on drums, which is uh, great, you know, just just uh, quite meandering in some ways, you know, uh, but uh, but but great, you know. So I think there's there, there's a lot of good stuff out there, you know. But I think as always, the stuff that gets the attention is always the kind of pop center ground with a lot of very ambitious people in it, you know. Yeah. And, uh, and they attract a lot of attention, and maybe the music is a bit of a sideline to what they do, you know. Mm. Maybe these days, you know. But, uh, but I, there's good stuff out there, you know, and really adventurous musicians as well. Yeah. 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 We, had, uh, we had Mike Reed on, so I guess this was probably about this time last year. Mm-hmm. And did you guys, I'm sure you have, done the Top of the Pops? Did you do that? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. What was your experience on that? Was that a cool deal? Yeah. Uh, I mean, again, you know, this is kind of like that, sort of jump as it were from playing like clubs and stuff to you know love sweaty london clubs to audiences that are, you know your audience in a way you know to doing a you know a bbc soundstage thing you know it was, it was a very different vibe you know but it was top of the pops in those days in the uk was the only music show really you know and uh and i watched it since i was a kid you know and i'd seen david bowie on it and you know the kinks the stones all the great bands you know so to sort of feel part of that legacy was a very powerful thing you know and i guess the things that people say about it it was all true you know so when you watch it on tv you get the sense that it's a sort of cool stage clubby kind of feel with a lot of people you know in reality it's like 30 kids in a very brightly lit room with a couple of stages oh okay yeah one band sitting up sitting up on one stage while another band's 
doing their thing on another. Mm. You've got these the old cameras, you know, like you know, right. shooting around and knocking people <laughs> over and stuff, you know. So it's quite sort of regimented in a way. And it's like, okay, clap now and you know, yeah. scream now. And you know. but um, but that was all part of the fun in a way, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, I, I think back then it was uh, I'm trying to remember because there was always this fight between the union, the musicians' union and and the record companies so the musicians union wanted the bands to play live you know and the record companies wanted the bands to mime to the record <laughs> because uh you know if you play badly or out of tune or the bbc engineers didn't set you up right and all of those things were perfectly possible to do you know right, you didn't right. do it's really you know unless it was extreme so playing live was really precarious you know whereas miming to your record you're gonna look good it's going to sound good you know? <laughs> but i think at that time the compromise was you mime to a backing track but you had to sing live you know so uh so there was a lot of pressure on me to deliver the, the vocal and stuff you know but whereas everyone else was pretty like relaxed and just like yeah. to try and play you know in time yeah. yeah but i remember doing the show with tina turner one time and she was singing live and that was the most incredible experience actually oh, just wow. standing in the room and listening to her voice which almost wow. didn't need a microphone <laughs> do you know what i mean it was like really loud and present and her presence as well was just incredible you know yeah. i think she was one of the first sort of like major stars that i saw doing her thing you know and you got the difference between that and what we were doing <laughs> <laughs> yeah Okay. Yeah, I guess uh, DC. I guess if we ever did a show, we would have to mind because people. Should be mind, right? <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'd have to. We'd have to do the Millie Vanilli thing or something. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. I yeah. think the same yeah. thing happened on. Was it Joan Rivers? I remember doing that when we did Everybody Have Fun Tonight and. Uh -huh. uh, and I had to sing it live, and I'd never sung "Everybody Have Fun Tonight" as a complete song. You know, in the studio, you do it in sections, and uh, and there's that bit, you know, where it goes really high, and uh, yeah, that was a very stressful kind of like <laughs> first time singing it in public in front of like twenty million people or something. You know? <laughs> but um, but there, that, that's the business, you know. That's yeah. sort of character building. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, that kind of that kind of uh, to kind of get us closed out here. Right before we do that, yeah, I was curious about this and. DH, you've asked this before. Um, what's one of the shows that sticks out to you yeah. and, and why? Um, I guess there's various shows, you know. Um, I think maybe a lot of musicians might say this, actually, you know, that they, they do shows but don't actually remember a thing about them because you're so sort hmm. of like zone and so kind of like pumped to do the show. You sort of come off in a bit of a daze, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I remember doing a show in Chicago uh, that was that was felt very powerful, actually. Good connection with the audience, you know. Uh, that was a big festival show. But probably the one that sticks in my mind most is a show that we did in Milwaukee called Summerfest, uh, more recently. And, um, you know, we started off the show playing, we did like a sort of like 40 minutes set, I think something like that. And when we started the show, we were playing in a tent on the Summerfest kind of complex. We weren't on a on the big stage, but it was a, you know, it was, it was big enough. And it was probably like a third full or something like that, you know, and some families and stuff, and people were just curious. And as we played, it gradually filled up with people. And by the end, it was packed. we like, like people standing in the doorways. You could see people like standing outside listening as well, you know. And uh, we played Dance All Days as the last song of, of a set and people just went crazy, you know. And, uh, and I remember standing at the front of the stage and taking the applause and, uh, and being very conscious of it, you know, because I know that in the 80s, I was so sort of like kind of struggling exactly, you know, but, but I always felt the gigs were never good enough. You know, I felt very sort of judged and everything. And also we were in this sort of support band slot where you have a sort of narrow zone to work in sort of thing, you know, physically and mentally really, you know. Uh, but I remember in that Milwaukee show, just sort of thinking like, that the applause just hit me. You, know, you could feel it in your chest, the, the noise people were making, you know. And uh, and I kind of thought, yeah, this is a lot of people give a lot to experience this. You know, people really into something that you've created, yeah. and they get yeah. a lot of out of it, and they want to show it back to you. You know, yeah, and that's very powerful. So I do remember that show. Very me. very special moments. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, Jack, can you uh, tell our listeners where they can? Uh, keep in check with you on what's going on and get out yeah. to your shows, of course, when you, you hit back to the States. Yeah, yeah, come and see us. You know, I mean, the, the tour is called The Lost 80s. 
tour. Um, I'm hopeless. I know the first show is the 12th of August in Salt Lake City. And after that, I'm just sort of like in the lobby at whatever time. I got to be in the lobby to travel to the next show, wherever the <laughs> right. You know, right. So, uh, so look out the dates. Do come and see us. You know, uh, we'll, we'll obviously be there, you know, but we want to try and do um, autographs and signings and meet people and stuff. Fantastic. And stuff may be a little restricted because of COVID and all, all the concerns. Sure. Sure. But whatever we can do, we will certainly do, you know. But in terms of keeping in touch with us, you know, there's a there's a Wang Chung uh, sort of Facebook page, which is mm-hmm. very active, you know, and will be more so as we do work on the tour. But I have a, a Jack Hughes Facebook page as well, and I have Instagram and Twitter as well. So you can contact me on those those mediums. All those you know? social medias, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I do all that myself, the Jack Hughes stuff, you know. And, okay. Uh, so, yeah, reach out. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. DH? Jack, Got anything just, to close us out? I just want to say, Jack, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, Absolutely. To with us. Uh, it means a lot uh, yeah. for, for us, you know, um, just two old high school teachers. Well, guys, love great. the 80s. <laughs> yeah, great. Great that you guys are there doing this, you know, because this all helps to sort of build and maintain that, that sort of uh, affection for the 80s. You know, I know during the 90s and the, the noughties when Nick and I weren't doing much together, there were a couple of guys, Brian Ware and Kent Markwart, who were uber Wang Chung fans, still are, you know. And they built a sort of, in the early days of the internet, built a sort of fan site and uh, an archive of all of that stuff. Yeah. And all of that stuff really mattered in terms of keeping the, sure. the legacy going, do you know what I mean? And uh, and it is guys like you that do it out of the love, you know, that the, yeah. the feeling for it comes from. So we all really appreciate that. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. You, Jack, man. take care. Safe yeah. in your travels and yes. well wishes to you, my friend. Yes. Thank you very much. Good and to speak if to you. Come near Nashville on the tour. If you see two old guys out here with a D&D hat on, you know it's us. Yeah, you know it's us. You can spot right. us very quickly. <laughs> I'll reach out to you. <laughs> all right. Thank all you. Right. All right, all right guys. All another right. great show. Jack, if you'll stay right there with us for a moment, we'll close it out. DH, right, another great. one, another great one, my friend. Another great show. DH. Let's stay in from the the heat. Yeah, we got another week of this blazing heat in the close to hundred degrees, my friend. So Definitely. stay stay cool. Definitely, okay. and I'm going to go ahead and remind everyone, folks. Remember, you can find us on Anchor, Spotify, Radio Republic, Breaker, Google Podcast, D and D Dynamite Eighties. Check out our Twitter, D and D Dynamite Eighties. And I'll have this one up on the YouTube channel yeah. within just mere minutes here, guys. Yeah. Uh, so check that out, YouTube channel, yep. D&D Dynamite yep. 80s. Also check out the website, uh, D&D Dynamite 80s. And, and what's your new, what's your announcement there, buddy? Coming up, we've decided we are going to become Facebook aficionados. <laughs> yeah. There you go. We've got to join that media for sure. <laughs> I'm so good, it. DH, good luck with that, doing that, bro. Listen, <laughs> again, Jack, I appreciate your time. Yes. Another great show, folks. Remember. It doesn't take anything extra to be kind to each other. So always be. Absolutely. Take care, my friends, and keep listening to those 80s. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.